Hello again, and welcome to the Travel Royally Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Royal Lynx Golf Tours. Uh, if you are ready to start planning your golf vacation to the British Isles, visit us at RoyalLynxGolfTours.com. We'd love to help. Today, we have Mr. Brian Kindle. He is the editor and founder of the website CanadianGolfTraveler.com. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Travel Royally Podcast. Today, it's our pleasure to welcome to the Travel Royally Podcast, Brian Kendall. Brian is the editor and founder of the popular website, CanadianGolfTraveler.com. And Brian is one of Canada's foremost and respected golf journalists. For more than two decades, Brian has written about golf travel for the Globe and Mail, which is Canada's leading newspaper. And he's written for other high-profile publications in Canada and around the world. He's also the author of six books, including Northern Links, Canada from T to T. Brian, welcome to the Travel Royally podcast. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. Now, I know that we're recording this at night, but I still have to ask, how many cups of Tim Hortons did you have today? <laughs> Actually, none. I am... Um... I I'm more a Starbucks type of guy. Um, oh my God! Yeah, no, you know Tim Hortons. You probably don't know this, but it's not even Canadian owned anymore. It hasn't been for quite a while. It's owned by a a Brazilian investment company. Wow! So the it's still ubiquitous across Canada, but it is um, not quite as Canadian as most people think anymore. Well, it they just put one in my neighborhood. Oh, did they? That's there aren't that many in, you know, south of uh, the uh, Canadian border, but we were lucky to get one. And it's, I, I I love it. And I think so, mainly because of the what we talked about earlier, my time in Canada. But also, uh, maybe it's because it's so brand new and clean and everybody's friendly in there. But anyway. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great, and it's very affordable. So if you're doing a road trip to the cottage or to different city or across yeah. Canada. I mean, they're always there and yeah. you don't, you're not breaking the bank just to have stop and have a donut. And also too, a thing that you might not know, or maybe you do know, um, the found the co-founder of Tim Hortons, uh, Ron Joyce started a quite luxurious golf resort out in Nova Scotia on the coast. And it's now, he's lavished all kinds of money on it. Cause he, when he sold Tim Hortons, he was a billionaire and, uh, they're now in the process of redoing all their golf with Canada's two top, top golf architects or traditionally a long time top architects, Tom McBroom and uh, Doug Carrick. And that's an exciting thing. That's going to open up in another year. And um, weren't you just out there? Were you I was just out there. I was out there in July. I had a look and Tom and uh, Doug, the architects were out there at the same time, which was exciting because we're old friends. And it's going to be a spectacular property. So um, yeah. another another hot destination out there, uh, along with Cabot uh, Links, of course, and Cabot Cliffs. Yeah. Which is right behind me. Which is right behind you, yes. But one of the things, you know, Canada's got a rich history with golf. And, you know, it goes beyond, uh, you know, uh, Mike Weir, uh, Mo Norman, when I think about Arnold Palmer, I think he won his first, wasn't the first tournament he won the Canadian Open? Yes, here not mistaken. Rome. Yes, his first PGA Tour win was in um, at Weston Golf Club here in Toronto. So I think yeah. was, he, he came back years later for the 25th anniversary of it all and the 50th anniversary of it all. And um, and last year's Canadian Open may have been the best ever, right? Well, yeah, it was so great that Nick Taylor, you know, that incredible putt, I mean, what were the odds of that going in? But what a thrill. And I interviewed him years ago for Reader's Digest, Canadian Reader's Digest, which was like this huge circulation at the time. And a uh, nice kid. He was still in university at the time. He was the number one amateur player in the world at one point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was that was a really amazing. <laughs> just a. I mean, I, I put that up there with uh, Shane Lowry winning the yes um, british open or the the open championship that yeah, was amazing yeah no it was amazing and it, for all canadian golf fans it's just a huge thrill it was just so exciting and that putt that made it i mean it was yeah i mean what were the odds of that going in like one in a 20 million or something <laughs> yeah i mean it was crazy 
So um, I know that you're a keen golfer, but what led you to become a golfer? How did you start it? Well, actually, you know, I was just a working class kid from the suburbs in Toronto. And um, so my dad was not a golfer and none of the dads around us were golfers, but just a bunch of guys. I think it was more or less inspired by um, Arnold Palmer and here in Canada, the success of George Knudsen in the 60s. Yeah. And we just went out and started playing in the backfield. And then we took our games to the golf course. Uh, you know, we'd buy clubs one at a time from a, a store called Canadian Tire, which like Tim Hortons is ubiquitous across the yeah. country. And um, yeah, we just uh, just started playing. And then I actually had given up the game by about the age of 18. I wasn't a bad player. I was actually fairly good, but... Who knows what I got into? Probably better not saying girls and whatever else. And then I didn't start playing again until I was in my 40s. And I was writing books at the time for Penguin Canada. And they and my books were selling fairly well. They were nonfiction books, sports books mostly. And they said, well, what's your next book? And, and my wife had been after me to take up the game again. And... Um, so I said to Penguin, well, how about, you know, a middle-aged man takes up the game again after 20 or so years and his adventures in Canadian golf over a season or two? And they said, sure, do that. And then, and then to make a long story short, I, I was not an unknown writer, as, as I mentioned. And I very quickly started doing virtually all of the golf travel writing for the Globe and Mail. And I said to my wife, I think we should stick with this for a while because suddenly I was traveling all around the world playing golf and uh, staying at uh, Four Seasons and Fairmonts and Shangri-La hotels and things like that. So it, it's been a great gig and I've been doing it now. I was just thinking I've been doing it for 25 years or so now. Wow, that's fantastic. Very lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, if I'm not mistaken, didn't you write a book about Terry Sawchuk? Do you, oh, you know of Terry Sawchuk, yeah. do you? Yeah, yeah, I did. I wrote a, bio, the, the, a biography of Terry Sawchuk, who for some of your listeners who aren't too familiar with uh, hockey, he's considered by most people the greatest goalie who ever lived. Yeah. He was also a very troubled man, uh, drinker, womanizer, lots of on, injured, I mean, back in the old barefaced era. And he was one of the first goalies to wear a mask. Anyway, that book uh, sold quite well in, in, in the U.S. as well, because, you know, Sajic played most of his great years for the Red Wings in Detroit. So, yeah, that was that was a fun book to do. Yeah, I, I was telling someone um, that I was going to be uh, interviewing you and um, they'd read the book. Really? And, That's cool. And they said uh, they said, oh, this guy was crazy. I mean. You know, and he was he I think they said, is he the one that started putting the marks or was that Dryden? No, that was the picture, the photograph you're speaking of was of Sawchuck. And I think it was for Life magazine, if I'm not mistaken. And what they did, so some people think that's how Sawchuck's face really looked. But what they had done was, uh, on a photograph of Sawchuck, just stitched with all, all the stitches that he had that they could record, you yeah. know, that, that they knew of. And his face was like this crazy quilt of, of scars. But it was not his real face. Yeah. That was a, sort of like what what it would look like if he'd had them all at one time, but yeah. he was injured all the time. It was, a, but a fantastic goalie, you know, just quickly. Um, the last time the Leafs won the Maple Leafs here in Toronto won the cup was in 1967 and Sawchuk perhaps more than anyone. That was his last hurrah. He won it for them. Wow. He was so brilliant in that 67 playoff that, that really they would not have even come close to winning it. If he had to be Terry Sawchuk. Well, had I, had, had I been born uh, later, I would have been reading your books because I remember as a child reading autobio well, biographies on uh, famous sports people. And I was fascinated with hockey. And I remember reading a biography on uh, Maurice the Rocket Richard. Well, the Rocket, yeah. I mean, and Gordie Howe was a hero. Gordy Howe was my guy when I was a kid. I in Toronto back in the old six team league, and you know at the, at that time Can, uh, Canadians were fanatical. They're not nearly so much anymore, but fanatical about hockey. And in the old six team league, and I in Toronto, I would wear my Red Wing uniform uh, jersey with number nine on it. I'd always be being razzed as I went everywhere and played hockey in it. 
That's fantastic. So we're here to talk about golf, well, yeah, <laughs> not right. hockey, but um, I wanted to give you uh, props for your uh, for your book. But what well, what you. what made you want to be um, a writer and and um, why golf? I, I understand how you how you wrote the book, but how did that lead to being the travel writer for Globe and Mail? Um. Well, okay. If we're just talking about my, I I was a writer before I got into golf. I've I've been had been making my writer uh, a living as a writer ever since I was twenty one, and you know, a writer, freelance writer, and then a magazine editor, and then uh, I left magazines, and then I was casting about for books to do, and I I wrote five, and then the, as I mentioned, um, why golf? It was just suddenly I was in demand to write golf articles by and the globe and mail gave me my entree like the one of the great entrees you could ever have because it's canada's now the big paper in canada right and um so i was invited everywhere and as i said um i think i said to you earlier I, my i said to my wife maybe we should stick with this for a while and see where it takes us and where it took us was great trips around the world and she loves to play golf and she's really has a beautiful swing and uh, so we played all around had many many trips together over to yeah. uh, to your favorite area, the British Isles and uh, Ireland. It was just wonderful. We've been very lucky. Yeah, it's quite a life. It what a life. Yeah, what a great life. What authors or journalists inspired you initially to get to to become a writer? Was there any any one in particular that stands out? Well, I'm seventy one now, so I'm back in the era when you know. Um, the new journalism with Gay Talese and fellows like that. Yeah. I've always been an avid reader ever since I was a kid. And even as a little boy, I thought I'd love to be a, a reporter. And then I, I didn't realize I didn't really want to be a newspaper reporter, more a magazine feature writer and an editor. But yeah, it's always been there with me. But the new journalism of guys like Gay Talese and Thomas Wolfe, uh, Tom Wolf and those those fellows. Th- that yeah. sort of was my inspiration in the late '60s and early '70s. Yeah, um, I, I've read a couple of Tom Wolf's books, not Gay Talese. I remember, you know, there there are classic books that stand out for me that were for, that were really important to, important to me in my formative years, um, and Catcher in the Rye was one, obviously, but of course. I remember about 15 years ago, I read Slaughterhouse Five. Oh, yes. And Kurt Vonnegut was just amazing. Yeah. I mean, absolutely amazing. Anyway, I, I don't have the gift that you have and other writers, but what? So, what led you to start uh, CanadianGolfTraveler.com? Well, that came later. I'd been doing the golf writing for by that time about. 12 years and I don't know like I'm a, when you ask me that now I'm not quite sure why um I guess it was just an extension of the brand really yeah and um now I'm really glad I started it because um you know as I get older I can dabble at it and another great thing about having a website is you have the articles on it exactly the way you want them to be rather than an editor who may not be particularly talented putting their stamp on it right um so you always have it it's just fun i like it i was an old mag i'm an old magazine editor so i'm still an editor now and my website you know it's it's just kind of like it's a hobby for me instead of doing wordle in the morning i do uh my tweets and i peck away at my website yeah It's, it's just just fun well um at the end i'll i'll make sure that you give everyone your handle for Twitter and the, the website, but I would encourage everyone that's listening or watching to visit the website. You, you know, you've posted wonderful blogs and articles and, and uh, I love your posts as well. And and part of it is because you're doing it from, I, I know it's not that different between the U S and Canada, but you've got a, you've got a Canadian voice that's refreshing. Well, well thank you. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that too much, but that's very nice of you. I think that's nice of you to say. Yeah, well, it's refreshing. So thanks. It's meant as a compliment. Yeah, I don't. Well, no, uh, I'm, I'm glad you said that. No, yeah, no, there are differences. You're right. And um, yeah, I'm a proud Canadian. Yeah, I, I, 
Um, I think America, people in your shoes here would be ignoring Canadian golf largely. Um, and I, I think, about, go ahead. I have I'm, a bit of a story about that. Okay. Okay. Um, Justin Wood is a fellow, I don't know if you've ever met him. He's in charge of golf for the Fairmont chain, which has like 16 golf properties around the world. And, yeah. um, he says to me once, you know, if the Banff Springs and Jasper Park Lodge were in the United States, they'd be as big as Pinehurst number two. And I believe that to be true. That's how brilliant those courses are. But because they're tucked away in Canada and in glorious spots out in national parks in the mountains, but they're tucked away in Canada and most Americans still don't really think that much about Canada. But he said, and I agree with him, if they were, Alistair McKenzie, you know, who did Augusta National in 1928 said that Jasper Park Lodge was the best golf course in America, in the Americas. So between right. Canada and the United States. And there are an awful lot of famous courses had been built by then. And he thought that Jasper Park Lodge course was the best. And that's a Stanley Thompson course. Both of them are Stanley Thompson courses. And he's a Toronto born legend of the game. Yeah. Well, isn't, um, if I'm not mistaken, Weren't the Fairmont hotels built as railway hotels? Exactly. As as um, Canada, as, you know, moved east and west and north, they would, um, Fairmont, well, back then it was uh, Canadian uh, Pacific and Canadian National, the two competing railways. And they would build ho these grand hotels uh, on the railway lines as they expanded across Canada. And the, the Banff Springs in particular started as a railway hotel. And just kept building and building, and now it's that castle in the mountains. I, yeah. I love that place. I, I, anytime you, you know, I can, if I may take a moment just to say to your your American uh, viewers that I really think a trip to uh, Banff and Jasper is is not only easy, but it's almost it, it's essential for people who consider themselves uh, well traveled golfers. Uh, and it's easy to get to from almost anywhere in the States. You fly to Calgary. That's not a problem. Yeah. Calgary's right. on the edge of the prairie. So you're still in the prairie when you're in the airport in Calgary. But then within 40 minutes or so, you're in the Canadian Rockies. And within an hour, full-blown Canadian Rockies. And then you're across into the Banff National Park, so pristine parkland in the beautiful town of Banff and the spectacular hotel, the Banff Springs Hotel, and that golf course in the mountain valley that Stanley Thompson built. Now, just quickly, three hours uh, from that, another drive through the park and into Jasper National Park, you're at Jasper Park Lodge, which is a much more lodgy, not a big hotel feel place, but lovely in every way. And that has that golf course that I mentioned just a moment ago, Jasper Park Lodge golf course, which Alistair McKenzie said was the best one in North America when in 1928 when he was writing about it. And that's an easy trip for many Americans. It's yeah. not hard to get to Calgary. And you can still take the train between the two, couldn't you? You could, yes. It's a long train trip. For, like where if you got the train, you can get the train in Calgary or Vancouver from either end and go say from Calgary to Vancouver or Vancouver to Calgary, and you're all through the uh mountains and it's gorgeous. I personally, if I were going to do that trip for the first time, I would rent a car at yeah. either of those two airports and just meander because you see it so much better and it's just much more fun. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your book for a minute. The one about golf anyway, Northern yeah. Lynx, Canada from T to T. Um, what let, that was about your two year yeah. reemergence re as a golfer. Yes, basically. And, um, so in that chapter or in that book, there are chapters on the Banff Springs, a huge chapter on the Banff Springs and how they did a big renovation of it. And the whole story of the Banff Springs, which I found fascinating. There's also a chapter on Marlene Stewart Street, the only Canadian in the World Golf Hall of Fame. Brilliant. She was the amateur, but if she had gone to the pros, as Joanne Carter said, she'd need a, a Brinks truck to take her money to the bank. She would have been so brilliant. And there are other diff other chapters, including one on uh, playing golf in the Midnight Sun Tournament in Yellowknife in Canada, subarctic on a on a golf course with sand fairways and artificial turf greens, which is quite a unique experience. I teed off at midnight there in 1999. It was 
a strange uh, experience, but really fascinating. So anyways, I won't go into every chapter, but just different adventures in Canadian golf, yeah. sort of, and uh, different stories. And also the story of George Newts and my hero worship of him uh, threaded through throughout the book in sort of little sort of ways. And yeah. Um, yeah, so the book, book worked out quite well. So I was really pleased with how, how it turned out. And, I, it, and it got good reviews. If someone wanted to buy that, where, can they get it on Amazon or? Yeah, can you can find it on Amazon. And yeah. I would say if you do want a copy of that book, uh, get the paperback, which has the Banff Springs on the cover, because it's a, a, I, I updated that book about, I guess, three years after the original hardcover. So get the paperback. It has the Banff Springs on the cover. You can't go wrong. And um, yeah, and I mean, you know, you can Amazon, you can probably get it for five bucks or yeah. something. So it's not a big deal. Do you have plans for another or more golf books? You know, my joke about that is probably not because it's so much fun to do what I do. Even though, you know, with the implosion of print media, I'm not doing as much of it as I used to, but that's fine because I'm getting older too. But so probably the answer is no, because when you write a book, you're in your little office for like, a year maybe or six months or, or six or whatever. And then instead of traveling around and playing golf, yeah, it's just writing and it's, it's a hard, hard job. At least I find it so. And um, so, I, and my little joke about that is it's, if, if there's a certain cachet, if there's a small cachet to having written six books, which I have done, there's not much more cachet to having written seven. So That's I'm, happy with, I'm happy with the six for now. I'm never. I'm not going to say never, but I think I might be done with it. And now it's just the website. I still write quite a bit, but I don't think I'll do another book. It's yeah. it's possible, but probably not. Now we talked about the courses out west, <clears throat> um, but if you know, and, and Canada is, is blessed with a lot of great golf courses, right? I mean, but do you have one that's your favorite? Well, you know, I would say the Banff Springs, uh, the Fairmont uh, Banff Springs is my favorite. It's just so beautiful there. And, and like, the, it's just God's country. And it's it's also very civilized, too, because it's a very civilized town. It's gorgeous. Some people think it's too touristy, but it just to me, it just means you've got more places to eat and things <laughs> to see. It's not touristy in a bad way, I don't find. And it's gorgeous, and it's a spectacularly good golf course, and it has that famous Devil's Cauldron Par Three. Yeah, uh, it's just unbelievably beautiful. So I even prefer that course to Jasper. S some would argue that Jasper is a better course. I don't personally think so. I would just flip a coin basically between the two. But yeah, that would be my favorite course. Wh but there where are so many, as you said. I mean, from the East Coast, you've got. Uh, Cabot Link or Cabot Cliffs, I should say, and its sister course, Cabot uh, Links. And Cabot Cliffs is generally now considered the best course in Canada. You know, Cor Crenshaw did brilliant work there. Yeah. And there's, there are terrific courses right across the country. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've never, like I said, I've only played one course in Canada. I'm actually, as I think about it, with the number of times I've been to Canada, which has got to be at least 25 times to say I've only played once is uh, embarrassing. And I've never been, while well, I've been through Jasper and National Park and, and out to Banff and Lake Louise, I haven't played golf there. And I haven't been to the course behind me. Yeah, I've never been to Nova Scotia, but I've heard wonderful things about the courses up there. Oh, well, yeah. The, the, behind you is a, a Cabot Cliffs, which is spectacularly good. And, um, yeah, well, you can't go wrong. And there's Prince Edward Island, which is sort of a very pastoral little island out in the Atlantic and yeah. not far from there. You could do a whole maritime uh, Canada trip. There's a lot of golf to be discovered in this country for most Americans, for sure. And um, Canadians love their golf per capita. I think we're the most avid golfers in the world, which surprises people. But it's true. And um yeah, with global warming, our seasons will be longer. Do you know that this past winter here in Toronto was the warmest ever recorded in, in Toronto history. Wow. We had virtually no snow. It was more like, and this is not a lie, more like uh, winter in 
say North Carolina almost. It was very wow. strange. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Well, Toronto's now, not in the snow belt anyway. We're not right. in the snow belt. But um, yeah, it, anyway, it was an amazing winter. Well, it's it's amazing to me how hard hit Buffalo gets, which is what two hours away from where you are. It just gets yeah. bubble. Just in a yeah, it's in that little bubble. It's in a, a snow belt, and just north of Toronto too is in a snow belt, even sixty miles north of the city. But now that's not to say, of course, that Toronto can't get a big snowstorm. Of course, we can. Yeah. But generally speaking, we're we we get some pretty fairly snow free winters, and now with global warming. And this year there was that El Nino effect. So it was like right. a crazy, crazy winter. Now I read somewhere that you played golf with Tom Weisskopf. If I'm not mistaken, it was in Arizona for the, was it yeah. the opening of a course he designed or? It was, yes. Well, it was TPC Scottsdale, you know, home of the Phoenix Open, well, Waste Management Phoenix Open. And um, this was uh, 2015. And um, he was there and I was there, well, few writers were there and um, we all played a, I played a few holes with him he was so thrilled to, so he had just redone it a little bit you know he yeah. did some bumper work and some other tweaks that made him happy and I really liked that course and what that course I've written about this what that course really shows is the magic that can be worked on even like a really uninspiring piece of desert wasteland yeah and 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 I think it was in the 1980s, they brought in regulations there because of the drought situation in the desert, of course, that you couldn't just have green fairways from, from tea to green. You had to, you know, really be sparse with your amount of grass that you could have on a golf yeah. course. So that's when they, guys like Weisskopf and his then partner, Jay Morish, sort of led the way and saying, well, we'll have these scrubby wastelands and then you hit from here to there and, 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 you know, cactus, will be a sort of uh, defining points on the course, like uh, fir trees might be on a northern course. Yeah, so it was um, it was brilliant, I thought. And, and, and I said that to him. Of course, he hears flattery all the time, but he seemed to really appreciate that. And um, yeah, so it was just a thrill to play a few holes. A real gentleman, a great guy. It was just a thrill. Uh, he still had a good golf game? Yes, he had a beautiful swing. And, he, you know, he was a big hitter in his day. And yeah. he still had a, he had a big guy. I remember George Newton said, oh, if I only had um, sort of the stature of Weisskopf, you know, with that power. Yeah. And because George Newton had a famously good swing that even Hogan said was, like, like pretty much perfect. And um, But Weisskopf had the great swing, plus he was powerful. So a great yeah. combination. Well, did you ever meet or interview Mo Norman? I knew uh, I have I had a nodding acquaintance with him. One of the most popular stories on my website is an article. Uh, I don't know, it's just a seven hundred words I wrote about new uh, about Mo Norman. I just had a nodding acquaintance with him because I was sort of getting in to the golf writing when he was getting old, and he you know he died in uh, I think it was two thousand and five. Yeah. And, uh, Oh, you know, the great Mo Norman story. Okay, so the poor guy is is down near the end now, and he's in a hospital. And somebody comes in, and he's in the hospital bed. And somebody says, Mo, uh, do you know where you are? He says, yes. And you know how he, he, he was on, no doubt, on the autism scale. And like the yeah. Rain Man, Dustin Hoffman in, in the movie, he would repeat himself twice. So he says, I know where I am. I know where I am. So where are you, Mo? He says, I'm over the fifth green. I'm over the fifth green. And they're like, what? And sure enough, that hospital had been built on a golf course where a golf course once was, and it was over the fifth green. Wow. Yeah. Uh, did you ever was... see him? Did you ever watch him like in an exhibition hit balls? Because I yes. said, yes. I've heard there was nothing like it. Yes. And um, I did. And in fact, one time at a media day here in Toronto, um at a golf course i was out in the middle of the fairway waiting for the green to clear ahead so i could hit my approach shot and suddenly i a ball thudded behind me like maybe 10 feet from me and i look back and there's mo norman on the tee laughing and pointing at me and later on in the club i said major i made you blink i made you blink and um he was just having fun with me because he yeah he, 
you know, he knew he wasn't going to hit me, but he could he knew that he was so accurate. He could come uh, like 10 feet if he wanted to, or five yeah. feet. I mean, Mo Norman was phenomenal. Yeah. That's amazing. What a character. Well, um, now you've had the opportunity to not only play in Canada and the U S but all over the world. Have you ever added up how many countries you played golf in? You know, I don't, I'm not the most intrepid golfer. Like I have turned down things. Um, uh, I wouldn't, I'm sure there are a lot of golfers who've played many more places than me. Um, but so no, I, I don't know, maybe 10 countries or so I played in hot, I played in China, which was thrilling. Um, yeah, no, I I would say there are a lot. Of, I, my focus has been more on like the United Kingdom and Ireland. Yeah. So I guess I can I can sort of never get away from that, and the mountains, and and of course in the states too. But um, yeah, I can sort of never. I mean, you know, you're a you're a seasoned traveler over in Scotland and Ireland, yeah. and it's so just it's so lovely over there. Well, you know, we talked before we went on the air about how your first Lynx experience was Royal County Down. And, you know, mine was Presswick. But you, you've you traveled extensively through the UK and Ireland. Um, and obviously, Royal County Down is just oh. what, a, what a place to, to have your first round of Lynx golf. Is that your favorite course over there? Or do you have a, oh, another boy. favorite? Why? Well, it's right up there, but and the course that I'm sure you must have played uh, that really blew me away. I when I played it, um, I don't know why I missed it somehow, but maybe because it's a little more out of the way. Cruden Bay. Yeah, I love Cruden Bay. It's so dramatic and yeah. awe inspiring in every way. And in fact, there's a uh, I wrote a column that had a lot of hits on on my website, like sort of saying, you know, I was torn between Dornick, Royal Dornick, and Cruden Bay. I mean. Most people, I think, would probably rate Dornick a, a little ahead of Cruden Bay, but boy, they're just both so incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and I, when my last trip over, I bought a, a club head cover from from both places, and now I'm sort of like the Solomonic uh, decision before every round, which which goes on my driver, the Cruden Bay or Royal Dornick. But um, yeah, what's going to bring you the most luck on that? Particular yeah, yeah, day? I love. Well, I mean, so spectacular. And then when you're, you know. And I'm sure you've played it too. You know, you're up in Northern Ireland, and and you're playing. Uh, if you're lucky enough to play uh, uh, Royal Portrush, and uh, and of course Port Stewart, love Port yeah. Stewart. And then you know you go down, and of course that is pretty getting to be famous. But is some people uh, don't play is Ard Glass, which is right yeah. in the middle of a an old what was once a Viking village when they had rampaged through the land and. Uh, just that's a great course too i mean it's just fun to be over yeah. there and you know what i'd really like to do now people say oh you gotta i i've been trying to stress to people that you can go over there and you don't have to play the bucket list courses exactly I'd be, I'd be quite content like to go over there for a month and play nothing but courses that most people on this side of the atlantic never heard of you know just 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 get a guidebook a golf guidebook and there are some good ones as you know and just go play some of these and there there are seaside true links that that people have never heard of that would be brilliant to play yeah. yeah or they could hire me to plan the trip for them or yes yes that's what they need to do you know do a yeah but you, you know what brian you make a really good point um a lot of people chase trophy courses like royal county down or port rush and they skip places like port stewart or ardglass yeah. or cruden yeah. bay or the courses around Doorknock, like Tain or Brora or Golspie. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I'd be just as happy to play those. I, I've, told, I've told this story a couple times, Brian, but I know you'll appreciate it. We had some clients two years ago that we couldn't get on the old course through the Daily Ballot. Right. But we got them on a course called Panmuir. Yes. Right next to Carnoustie. Yes. So I texted them at the end of the day to see, hey, how did you get along at Pamir. And the one guy's response was, thank God we couldn't get on the old course because we'd have had to miss Panmure. There you go. Exactly. I mean, yeah. And and you can't, it's hard to tell people that, that 
when you say you're going to love a pan mirror, an art glass, a port steward, a brewer or whatever, until they come back and they go, now we get it. We understand oh, what you meant. Exactly. You don't have to do all those. I mean, sure, it's fun to play a, a bucket list course, but it's not essential. I mean, geez, what a trip you could have just by playing the type of courses that you just mentioned. And even if you go to St. Andrews and you don't get on the big course, there are, what, six other courses right in town. Yeah, right. And just like, a, what, at the, maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong, like 30 minutes away, you've got Crail and Levin Links and London Links. And man, yeah, Kings Bars, of course, is very close to town. Yeah. I mean, what more do you need? It's, yeah. it's just, and then you could still hang out in St. Andrews if that's what you want to do and go from there. Yeah. Uh, but it's spectacularly good. Another area I imagine you're familiar with too that I really think that people, North Americans, should uh, investigate more is the, what they, the market is England's Gulf Coast, you know, between yeah. Liverpool and up through Southampton and a little bit north of Southampton. There are like 300 courses there <laughs> and many of them links. You yeah. can literally, as you know, walk from almost walk from one links to the next. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And three royals. So yeah. I don't know how many people you're sending that way. I'm I'm sure you're encouraging them to, yeah. you know, especially after they've done Scotland and Ireland. But boy, what a spectacular. It's as good a stretch of Lynx land as any in the world. Right. Well, um, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. We we've we've got people going over there um to England. I'm looking up at my list of uh, groups. We've got a, a group that leaves in about four weeks. Now they're going to the other coast. They're going in England, but they're going down in Kent, right. Royal St. George's, Prince's, Singports, Rye, Littlestone. But, you know, because you and I have been over there and we played these courses, like, I mean, I'd be hard pressed to name a poor one or one where I didn't enjoy myself. And, exactly. and when you get into Wales, mm -hmm. it's very affordable, it's mm -hmm. even more quaint. Mm -hmm. um, you've got Conwy, Royal St. David's, Aberdubby, Pennard, Tenby, Royal Porthcall, um, Ashburnham. I mean, I could, there's, it's just amazing the number of great golf courses around the, the UK and Ireland. Exactly. And it's beautiful countryside. I mean, it's, it's really everything that, uh, a visiting North American could want. Yeah. And and as you say, it, if you do some of the fun stuff uh, after golf, like go to a distillery or see a castle or or whatever is you, you know your particular interest, there's just so much so much to see and do. Well, what do you what do you and your wife like to do as an example after golf over there? Is there anything special that you guys like to do? Well. Um, of course, you know, we, we like to tour around a bit and see the sights. Like if we're in Scotland and we've been up into the highlands and then you, we did a boat tour. It's pretty touristy, but we did a boat tour of uh, Loch Ness. And uh, and um, and then we've also stayed at Loch Lomond uh, at, and played the Carrick course there, which is a Canadian design course by Doug Carrick. And um, yeah, and then, you know, my wife and I really, I mean, I don't know who, how you couldn't love it but and i'm sure you do too edinburgh yeah. it's only a city of half a million but it seems like so much more important than a city of half a million they're beautiful restaurant the scenery is gorgeous yeah that's another one you know if you were to travel say a guy and just by chance his wife wasn't interested in golf you could stay in Edinburgh and then uh, have a driver take you out into what's marketed as Scotland's Golf Coast, right next door to the city, right. and then come back in the evening and have a great Edinburgh night out. Yeah, and I agree. And, uh, it, and, you know, you've got, you know, another course that maybe isn't as famous as some of the others that I really enjoy, and I, I'm sure you've played, is Dunbar, which is on that yeah. area. I mean, what? And there are others too that aren't even uh, especially yeah. well known that are still fantastic. So, I'm yeah, having I mean, someone from Dunbar on the podcast tomorrow. As a matter of fact. Oh, good, good. Yeah, yeah. I yeah mean, you're so absolutely right. Now, and you, you've led me into the next question, which is, you know, again, I love your writing. Thank you. What you wrote about uh, Royal St. David's was exactly how I felt. Um, you wrote about Wallasey, right next to, right near yes. Liverpool. 
yeah. Um, but from your point of view, what are your favorite, what we call diamonds in the rough, those courses or a region where you think there's great hidden, hidden golf in Great Britain and Ireland? Hmm. Does anything stand out? Um, oh, geez. There's just, it's everywhere. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just everywhere. One course, well, this is not a hidden gem at all because it has so much publicity, but I'd really like to get to Ireland's Northwest and play um, the Rosa Pena course, the new one there, St. Uh, St. Patrick's. St. Patrick's yeah. Have you played that? I haven't yet, but we've got a trip there next year. I'd love to play that course. Um, and, you know, and also explore that area a little bit because it's sort of off the beaten track, generally thinking for for, for most tourism yeah. visitors. It's sort of off the beaten track, but there's also a Tom, an old Tom Morris course there. And um, who's the, thir uh, the third course? Is it Gil Hand? I forget, but there's another, a third excellent course there as well. Yeah. I'd really like to go and explore that area. And Yeah, uh, I think I think that's a good call, Brian. I think that's, for me, that's like the last outpost where it hasn't exploded yet. But yeah. So you've got Nairn and Portneau, which is a Gil Hans design, just right. recently completed there nearby. Yeah. Yeah, you've that's got right. the three courses at Rosa Pena, I mean, Port Salon, I mean, Crutch Island. There, There's plenty of golf there to enjoy. And another place that, um, again, you're very well traveled over there, and I'm I'm almost certain you've played it, is Macrohanish, the old yeah. course in Macrohanish. Yeah. It's like Golf's Brigadoon. Yeah. It's like absolutely. a magical spot. It's harder to get to, as you know. Yeah. But boy, it's worth the trip. And you're just in this little magical village. And then there's this that's one of the great golf courses. Yeah. Really. I mean, we talked about earlier, we talked about, well, what's my favorite or what that's certainly one of them. Yeah. And um, and the other course too, and then there's the newer course there, the McClay Kid course. Uh, that's also excellent too. Yeah. So you've got the two there. I mean, once you do make the trek to get there, because it's up sort of just beside the Mullican tire. So it's hard to get to. But I mean, my wife and I always joke, you know, when you're you're talking to a Brit, they might say, Oh, it's a terrible long drive. It's a four hour drive. Well, you know, my wife is from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and that's an eight hour drive from Toronto. So the distances over there to us yeah. don't seem like much at all. Right. Right. I agree 100 percent. Yeah. Or like, you know, I'm, we hop in the car and drive to uh, North Carolina or something or Florida. And that's the two day drive. So, yeah. I mean, I don't we don't get it when uh, people over there say, oh, it's a terrible long drive to get there. Well, it's two hours. That's nothing. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, we I forgot when we were talking before that we went on the air. I didn't mention Wallacey, but I love the piece you did on Wallacey because I was like, uh, I haven't played there, so I'm on the edge of my seat. Like, you know, yeah. I, I was I was excited to hear about that. Such a great area. I mean, that that again for your your viewers. That's again that's the English England Gulf Coast that's been marketed as that, and it's so spectacular because yeah. so many people in North America. Because you know, it, I'm sure you work hard to keep it affordable, and I'm no doubt you do. But for some yeah. people. It's like this big trip that maybe once in a lifetime. So they're probably going to go to Scotland. Or if they're so inclined, they might say, no, I'd rather go to Ireland. So yeah. like uh, England's Gulf Coast is maybe third uh, yeah. on their list. They're not on their list at all. But it really, it's just as good. And it's really beautiful. Well, I'll tell you a trip that you'll appreciate. We had a father and son last year. We sent them and they played the, the area that you're talking about. They played... Um, Royal Lytham, Royal Birkdale, Royal Liverpool, wow. and they played Southport and Ainsdale, which was a a Ryder Cup yeah. venue back in the 30s. Yeah. Then we took them across the country, and they played three more Open Championship courses. They played Royal St. George's, Royal Sinkports, and Princes. Wow. So you played six of the 14 venues to ever host the open in one trip plus a Ryder cup venue and but yeah i think you know one of the things that we do i'll give you away a trade secret is to build an affordable trip 
is to put people for a week in St. Andrews in a B&B. Yes. And just have them that they, so all they need is a ride from the airport to St. Andrews. They can walk to four of the good courses right there, right yeah. on property. They can take a bus or we can have a driver take them out to the castle course or mm -hmm. some of those courses you mentioned, like leaving links, London links, Crail, Ely, whatever. And if you've got two to a room, it, exactly. it can be very affordable. Yes, exactly. I agree. And, you know, if you're if you're a guy, say you're going with your son or your well, your wife or whom, or your best friend, it's OK to share a room. I mean, you know, as long as you know you're getting along, why not do that and save money? And as you just said, you know, a bed and breakfast. I've done exactly what you said. Not I didn't share a room, but I was in a beautiful bed and breakfast in downtown uh, St. Andrews. And I thought I, I was just in heaven. I it was great. And I didn't I, I didn't get to play the old course that time, but I'd played it before. And it wasn't I mean, of course, I want to play the old course, but I'm not it, it's not heartbreaking to me. And it rained all day. I'd been out at Crail and I was with a guy from the Golf Channel and we'd both gotten soaked. And he finally said, I'm not playing anymore. I'm going. So we dragged me off the course and he had the keys. So I had to go with him. And um, but that day I had just come out from dinner on my own and. The sun suddenly shone and I walked out. No one was on the old course. I walked out into the old course, deep into the old course in this perfect uh, seven o'clock evening. The sun had just come out for the first time. And I thought, this is one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I didn't have a golf club in my hand. I yeah. just was out there walking the old course. Yeah. And no one bothered me. It yeah. was beautiful. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it's a great, great town. You yeah. just hang out there. Yeah, I think it's, you know, like you were talking about um, restaurants in other places. They've got like lot wonderful restaurants. St. Andrews is full of yes. wonderful restaurants now. B&Bs, really nice hotels, mm -hmm. um, great shopping. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the universities there. The, I mean, what's not to like there? Exactly. And now I don't know if you ever put people into the Fairmont there, which is, which is also nice too. It's just on the edge of town, and yeah. you have regular shuttles going back and forth, and you've got the big all the comforts of a big North American style hotel. Yeah. And they've got two golf courses too, and you've got yeah. views, wide views of the the bay and um the old town, the spires, the medieval yeah. spike towers of the of the old town. So there's a spot too if you've got someone who says, "No, nah, I really want to have the really that's the big soft bed and the big room." Well, there's that too. There's that yeah. one. So, we love putting people out there. Everyone loves the Fairmont. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very it's 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 a terrific place to stay. So, in all the places that you've played around the world, what what's your favorite golf course in the world? Well, you know, it's funny because I. Maybe it's my Canadian nature coming through, but I really do love being in the the Rocky Mountains yeah. and, and Mount Springs. Now I don't know if I'm gonna say I, you know, but if you put me on the old course teeing off or Cruden Bay or Royal Dornick or, geez, so many over there that you just thrilled to play. Yeah. But I would if you had if you're gonna force me to pick one, and I I maybe would on a gorgeous summer day teeing off at the Banff Springs in the mountains. That's as good as it yeah. gets. And, and, and staying at the Banff Springs Hotel. Um, you've you've wet my whistle for that trip. I, oh, you've gotta, to, you got to go. I want to go in the fall when the leaves are turning. The trouble with that is it's not the leaves don't turn as much in the mountains. It uh, does turn golden. And also, too, you don't want to leave it too late because you're high altitude. Yeah. So I would say mid-June to mid-September. I mean, you can stretch it, but, you know, if you want the really good weather, that's because you're, you know, it's fairly north. You look on the map, it's it's up there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so here's one more question for you. All right. Again, you've played you and I have both been able to play a lot of wonderful golf courses. Um, what's the one course in the world that you haven't played that you'd like to play? You know, I sort of touched on it before. I really I don't know why, but. I really want to play St. Patrick's Links. Oh, that's Ireland. right. Yeah, I really want to play that one. Uh, other than that, um, oh, the new uh, Cabot course down in uh, 
uh, Cabot St. Lucia. It's the yeah. St. Lucia, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that that and that's Cora Crenshaw and Cora Crenshaw are, do fantastic work. Yeah. They're as good as it. Well, there's so many terrific golf architects right now. But that would be a nice one to tick off because well, it would be pretty luxurious. Oh, you know what another one is? I was thinking earlier. Uh we were talking about Tom Weisskopf and he's got a course, his only course on continental Europe is uh in Tuscany. Castellon de Bos del Bosco, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. And it's cut through a Tuscan vineyard and it's very closely connected to a hotel that was voted by Travel and Leisure the best hotel in the world in 2022, two years ago. So imagine that you're playing this course, a beautiful Weisskopf course, cut through, and there's a very prestigious uh, winery there that is connected to this whole thing, like one of some of the best wines in the world. So that would be, and you're staying at the hotel that may be the best, most luxurious hotel in the world. That's if you were a rich man, that would be a, that's a lovely way to go. What a what an experience that would be. With drinking wine after a round in this course and staying in one of the best hotels in the world. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. I'll never, it'll probably never happen, but I mean, I'd love to do it. Well, we've got a trip over to Italy this fall that wow. we're hosting. And uh, while we're not playing that course, we're playing three courses. It's a couple's trip, but it's more about wine tasting. We've got a uh, a cooking class for an evening. We've got a day in Venice, a day in Parma, a day in Florence. Um, wine tastings, three rounds of golf. Can't wait. Well, that's a, and you're going on that one, are you? You got to do it. It's like you. I've got one of those jobs that people love to hate you over, right? Like yes, you get to exactly. go everywhere. No, no, that's a great trip. Boy, that sounds wonderful. So, what advice do you have for people going to the British Isles to play golf for the first time? To play, and they're playing links golf. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Um, I, well, I would say, you know, mix, unless the budget is unlimited and you, okay, so maybe there are two or three, if it's a big trip and you, a couple bucket list courses and then, you know, um, uh, mix in some of the courses like we we talked about, ones that are really are known to be terrific courses, but don't get all the publicity. Yeah. And are less expensive and less, and you know, sometimes it's difficult to get on the bucket list courses now, increasingly so, especially with the pent up demand after COVID. Right. So, um, but I guess a guy like you has ends with some of these courses. So that's why, <laughs> why people use people like you and, and why they should. But, you know, mix it up a bit. You know, don't be committed to, I've got to play a bucket list course every day. You're going to have just as good a trip and it's going to be more affordable if you do a mix of the buck, a couple bucket lists, but maybe three or four of the ones that are still great. And then you've been recommended to you, but you know, uh, maybe people don't know of as much. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful advice. I think. Um, and, and truthfully for those people that are on a budget, that's the way to make it affordable. If you take that St. Andrews trip that we talked about where you've got two people to a room, you're basically in St. Andrews. And if you play Carnoustie one day, play Panmere the next. Exactly. If you play Kings Barnes one day, play Crail the next. If you're playing the old course one day, play the new course the next. Mm -hmm. You'll have as good a time as if you played all championship courses, but the price would be significantly less. Exactly. So I agree with that philosophy 100%. So, Brian, I promised to promote you um, on this broadcast. So, uh, if you would, tell people how they can find you, where they can find you. Uh, well, my website is the easiest way. Uh, or my, yes, my um, my website, canadiangolftraveler.com. Uh, Traveler is spelled the Canadian-British way with two L's. But I think you can get there if you just put the one in. It's fine. So CanadianGolfTraveler.com. I'm also on Twitter at, at, at CDN Golf Traveler with one L there. So at Canadian Golf Traveler on Twitter. So um, and 
And if you're really a diehard and want to try uh, one of my books, you know, you can look me up and some of my books are shown on my website. And as again, you could probably get a battered old used copy for five bucks or something on Amazon and most of the books. But buy a new cool. one. Let it make a couple of bucks. Yeah. They're old now, so that I, I don't think I'd ever see any money from them anyway. So get the bargain if you can. That's fine by me. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been fantastic having you on, Brian. I really appreciate your investing part of your evening with us. And uh, I'm, I'm certain that our listeners are going to going to love this conversation we had. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Well, I hope to talk to you again soon. Be well. Okay, you too. Thank you very much. Thank you again for tuning in. We really appreciate Brian for coming on. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe so that you know when the next one comes out. Like and share, and we'll see you next time.